All right, joining me now, we have two people who play a major role in putting together the 18-week, 272-game NFL schedule that just came out. We have Mike North, who is the VP of NFL Broadcast Planning, and Charlotte Carey, who is the NFL's Director of Broadcasting. Mike, Charlotte, thanks for coming on. How are you? Thanks for having us, Ari. We're we're doing pretty well this week. Yeah, doing good now. (laughs) I'm assuming the potential complaints that teams or networks have had is all done with. Am I right, Mike? Not quite. Um, You know, the clubs all got their schedules on Wednesday and the networks all got their schedules on Thursday, but they only got their own. So all they saw was their own little vertical, their own little bucket. Generally speaking, Wednesday and Thursday went pretty well. Everybody was comfortable. Everybody understood the, you know, whatever shortfalls they uh, think they had in their schedule, but most teams and networks were pretty happy with it. Um, you know, Thursday night, the schedule comes out Friday. And then over the weekend, they start to see what everybody else got. Right. And so now some of the networks are like, Hey, we're still happy with our list, but they got a pretty good game over there. in week eight. we would have loved to have that one. Or, you know, a team says, you know, now that we see everybody else's schedule, we realize that, you know, we're the only one in the division with a three game road trip or we've got the earliest buy in the three game road tri- of, of the division. Or now we see where everybody is the week before they play us and our negative rest discrepancy. So those are the kind of things that are still kind of trickling in, uh, working with some of our stadium operators, making sure they understand things like flexible scheduling in the Saturday pools before they go book other events in their buildings. Still a few more days, but uh, certainly not as stressful and 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 not as uh, not as bad as it's been. I mean, I, I know we talked to you last year, Ari, but, you know, eight, 10 years ago, I've been doing this a long time, 10, 15 years ago. Um, schedule release day wasn't always awesome. You know, there were definitely schedules that were challenging and there were teams that had legitimate gripes. Uh, most of the complaints now are, are kind of on the margins. And, and I think everybody kind of understands the process. Yeah. And the one thing that I always hear from the schedule makers, you and the other four people involved, is that there's no such thing as a perfect schedule. You can't make a perfect one where everyone is satisfied, but it feels like this year, for the most part, it came out pretty well for the most part, the way the primetime games came out, the way every team is where they are. I believe there are only two teams of three game road trips this year. Um, so for the most part, it feels like everything came out the way you guys would have wanted it. But I want to start off fairly simple for general question. I guess I'll go to you, Charlotte. How do you even start the process of making a schedule? When do you start? How does it work? What do you use? I mean, it feels like the average fan doesn't fully understand how complex this really this really is. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a, the 10 cent tour into our entire process. So um, Mike and I generally start the day after the regular season. That's when we have our are all of our matchups for the following year. Um, a lot of the matchups are rotation based, but there are a couple um, that end up being standings based. So after the regular season ends, then we have our final matchups for the year and we can actually lock and load and get started. Um, so all throughout the playoffs, we're kind of starting testing phases and putting a couple packages together, but we really can't get fully started until we get through the Super Bowl and know who wins the Super Bowl because that last piece is our kickoff game. So we need to know who wins the Super Bowl to know who's going to open the season up on uh, on Thursday of week one for the NFL for that big kickoff game. So essentially, you know, we kind of do some tinkering and, you know, get the model started the day after the regular season. But it's really not until Super Bowl when we close and lock the door and just think about this all day, every day from then until basically release date. So it's a little bit like Groundhog Day. The way it works is we have a fantastic software partner in Optimal Planning Solutions out of Western Canada uh, who works with Garobi um, Optimization. And we also use AWS for our cloud instances in order to actually get this process done. And what we do is we write our rules into the system every night and try to generally lock things out that we really don't wanna see. So we'll look at every schedule, evaluate it and say, ooh, you know what? That game really doesn't fit in week two. If we're going to play this, especially if we're gonna play it in prime, it would be better potentially later in the season. Let's let's make sure we lock that in late. Some of those things you know, that we tinker with throughout the entire process or, oh my gosh, that, that team has a really onerous three game road trip. They're going cross country, you know, they're an East coast team going cross country to LA and then coming back across back to the East coast. That's really hard from a travel perspective. Let's probably try not to do that. So we have all of these, you know, 
constraints that we write along the way. And essentially every single day we see new schedules and those are based off of the constraints that we wrote the day before. So it's a little bit like Groundhog Day where we write our rules, set the computers off to go run. Mike kind of babysits around, you know, till around two or 3 a.m. Then I'll get up early and start babysitting around five, take those schedules, see what we got overnight, do the analysis, write new rules and do the whole thing again. So a little bit like Groundhog Day. Yep, and this starts again before even the the when the Super Bowl really when the season ends, and then the Super Bowl ends is really when you have everything set up. The thing that fascinates me is especially this off season, Mike. I don't think we've ever had so much player movement the way we had this off season. And on top of that, the Brady retirement and unretirement. How wild was all the player movement for you guys, and how much did that affect things? essentially every day during that March period where we had something else going on from Brady to Wilson to Mac and on and on. We're really lucky, Ari, because we have automated this process so much. You always have to leave room for, you know, the human input and, and, you know, the emotional reaction. We always talk about gut and feel and instinct and experience. And, you know, Howard Katz, the guy who runs the scheduling process, will say things like, oh, that sounds like a football game. And Charlotte and I have to figure out how to write a mathematical equation <laughs> for sounds like a football game. Um, you know, all of the Tampa Bay games this year sounded like football games. They play Kansas City. They play Dallas. They play Green Bay. They play the Raiders. They play the Rams. I mean, literally every Tampa Bay game sounded like a football game. Sounded a little bit different when Brady retired. Um, and sounded, you know, big and exciting and must see TV again when he unretired. So every time one of those big player movements happened, um, generally we all text each other. Oh my God, did you see this following, you know, Schefter or somebody on Twitter? Um, and then if this is true, what are we going to do? So we all get together on a zoom, the whole team, and we stop all the computers and we kind of take stock, you know, here as of right now is what we're doing with all those Tampa games. Now the Brady's back under center. Should we move this one to Sunday night? Should we move this one to ESPN? Should they be a three appearance team on Sunday night football? Should they be a two double headers on Fox, two double headers on CBS? Maybe they weren't going to be headed for quite as much national television when Brady was retired, but obviously when that guy unretires and decides to keep playing, we're going to make sure that our fans get to watch as many of his games as we can. So every time one of those big moves, whether it was Russell Wilson or Matt Ryan or Tyreek Hill or any of them, um, we kind of stopped, looked at each other, looked at the rules and kind of made some decisions about, hey, what is this worth now? What do our fans think about this game today that they didn't think yesterday? Should we find a better home for it? Interesting. So let me jump into this schedule because there are so many interesting nuggets that I was looking at. And I guess let me start at the top of the first game, which is the Bills and the Rams. And really, when I look at the Rams home schedule, there are a lot of really great games. It feels like the Bills one is the juiciest one out of all of them. I guess, how did you land on Buffalo? Because it feels like previously when you have a juicy game and the first game of the year, everyone is waiting for football. We're going to watch it regardless. How did you decide on landing on, I guess, the best one and putting them there? And I guess I'll give this one to Charlotte. Yeah, you know what? Honestly, it's it's a it's a good question. I think you could argue that there there are a few games that you could put there that you could categorize as potentially the best game. You've got I juicy. Mean, I think was his word. Juicy, 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 <laughs> juicy game. There we go. Uh, you've got Dallas at home versus the Rams. You've got San Francisco. You've got Denver. You have Las Vegas. You have Buffalo. I mean, there are plenty of options that we could have gone with this year. So I think that, you know, the Rams schedule in general was fairly interesting. And this was, this was definitely a little bit of a different um, starting point for us. As we said, as I said before, we kind of lock in that kickoff game and go from there. We didn't really lock in a kickoff game per se this year. We had to play it obviously in LA, you know, the, the Rams were going to be in the game, but we let the computer float a little bit here. And this was definitely a different path for us. We had so many great options that we didn't lock one game in and say, oh, it has to be Buffalo. Let's only see, let's only see Buffalo from here on out. We let it show us all the options. And, you know, I think we ended up getting fairly comfortable with Buffalo later on in the process, but quite frankly, any of those games would be juicy, at least, you know, at least us, that's what we were going for. But I think that we're all happy that we landed on Buffalo. No, absolutely. I think the overall reaction by everyone was, okay, we cannot wait for September 8th to finally come and watch that game. Now, there are so many great games in week one. It's just jam packed. But, you know, I was kind of moving into week two and this was announced earlier in the week before everything came out. And I was a bit 
in- interested in how this all works. You guys put on Monday night, two games in week two, but previously before last year, you guys always had two games on Monday night in week one, but they wouldn't overlap this year. You have two games on Monday night and they're overlapping. Mike, h- how do you explain that happening this year? Yeah. The, the key thing to think about there is we've got ABC now as a, a, a league partner again. Uh, you'll remember they had Monday night football way back when uh, they've been out of the family for a little while, but starting about, I don't know, Charlotte, five years ago, six years ago, they started simulcasting the ESPN wildcard game. Yep. ABC started to get back into the NFL family. They've been simulcasting a few Monday night games, uh, the same game side by side on ESPN, ABC, uh, what they negotiated for in the new media deals. And what you see here in week two, this season is their own game. So you mentioned we used to play the Monday night doubleheader in week one. Um, that was on the same network, so you couldn't overlap them. So we had to go 7 o'clock Eastern and 10, 15 Eastern. By kicking off an NFL game at 10, 15 Eastern, you're doing a couple of things. One thing you're doing is you're limiting the number of places where you can play, right? We're not going to kick off at 10 o'clock Eastern time in the East Coast, so you know you're playing out West. Um, and then you're you know, starting a game that late. You're finishing a game you know, probably after 1 o'clock in the morning here on the East Coast, of the television households are in the East. That's a long time to ask them to stay awake to watch a game that they're likely not going to have a rooting interest in. Because like we said, it's probably a Raiders, Chargers, Broncos, something like that kind of game. So we know uh, what our fans think and we know how uh, the television patterns, the television viewership patterns go when we have two games back to back on the same network, seven o'clock and 10 o'clock. Now that ABC is in the mix, we have this opportunity to try something different, try something new, and let's see what we learn. We're going to try ESPN kicking off early, 7-15. We're all going to watch the first half of Tennessee Buffalo. Good game, two good teams from that conference. And then hopefully right at halftime, we can switch over and catch kickoff of that second game and go football to football. ABC kicks off Vikings-Eagles at 8-30. And then, yeah, you've got a bit of an overlap, but let's see what our friends from Disney can do with this. They can take us back and forth. They can do a split screen. They can do live look-ins. They can do game breaks. They can do uh, a whole bunch of things that, you know, didn't have the opportunity to do when they had the same game, when they had two games back-to-back on ESPN. So we'll learn a little something, two side-by-side Monday night games, ESPN and ABC, and we'll take what we learned from this year and roll it forward in the next year. We've got one such occasion this season, ABC and ESPN side-by-side, three times. We're going to do it next year. So we could do three different things next year. We could do three of the same thing. We can do them back to back. We can do them simultaneous. Let's see what we learn. Let's see what our fans tell us. Let's see how ESPN and and ABC handle it. And we'll go from there for next year. Interesting. So that's one thing that's new this year. And now you mentioned there's potential for three of them next year, but you have options there. Now, the other thing that's kind of new this year, not kind of, it is new, is that Amazon officially is getting the Thursday night games, which is a massive change for the NFL going into the streaming avenue. Charlotte, was there a bit of an urgency to put more, I guess, marquee matchups on Thursday night simply because it's a major change and you want to make sure everyone gets accustomed to Amazon. So you put a big game, the average fan wants to see it. They have to figure out how this works now. Was that kind of part of it? Why are there so many good games on Thursday night this year? Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, first of all, we're excited to have Amazon as our new Thursday night partner. This is definitely a new package starting in week two, whereas before we would have the NFL network do the early part of the season, then then have the tri-cast model from there on out. So this is definitely a little bit of a, a new model. Um, and as you probably know, all teams play on Thursdays in the NFL. We have two teams coming back and playing two Thursdays, but which is new this year, but all teams play on Thursdays in the NFL. So making up the Thursday night schedule, you know, you've got to, you've got to actually work with the constraints of time zones. We don't generally do more than two time zones for trips. And also every team has to play on Thursday. So whether that's Thanksgiving Thursday or on the Thursday night football package on Amazon, every team will be on. So to be honest with you, I think that uh, we were definitely trying to maximize every partner schedule, Amazon being one of them. And we were fairly happy with the way that we were able to construct this particular Thursday night schedule with, you know, a lot of great tempo games starting off with Chargers, Kansas City. You know, that's that's one for me that I was really excited about that could have landed on Sunday night, could have landed on Monday night, could have landed Thursday night, could have been a double header. It's a fantastic football game. So we're really excited to kick off the Amazon package with that. And, you know, and we actually have one more Thursday night game than we used to in in the past, which is that two teams coming back for a second short week Thursday in week 17. So we're ending the season here with Dallas, Tennessee, which we're all really excited about as well. 
Interesting. So that's definitely a major change for the NFL coming up this year, going to Amazon. Now, one of the other things that kind of stuck out to me, Mike, and I don't really think I've ever seen it happen before on an initial schedule, and maybe you could correct me if I'm wrong, but the Patriots have four consecutive primetime prime time games from weeks 12 to 15. How does that come to fruition, and has it ever happened before? I don't remember ever seeing that. I'll be honest with you. I don't know if it's ever happened before. Um I wouldn't be surprised if it happens before, if it happened before, Um, you know, as you can see, our national television packages tend to coalesce around the same teams over and over again. A lot of Packers, a lot of Cowboys, a lot of Chiefs, a lot of Patriots, Um, hopefully leaving some room for some surprise teams to kind of play their way into prime time. Um, But what happened with the Patriots this year was a couple of things ended up happening One of them was the fact that we decided relatively early in the process that Vikings Patriots was going to be the Thanksgiving night game. What that did was it gave us some flexibility as we like to come back after Thanksgiving Thursday, the following Thursday, back on the TNF partner Amazon this year. Um, You get to play two teams on that Thursday who are going to come off a full week Thursday instead of a short week Thursday. So you bring back two of the six Thanksgiving teams to play the following Thursday. We were pretty solid on Buffalo Detroit kind of early in the process. We knew obviously Dallas was going to be there. If you play New England, Minnesota as the Thanksgiving night game on NBC gives you a couple different options. When you come back the following week, you can come back with Dallas, Minnesota, or you can come back with New England, Buffalo. So we like the idea of being able to have two different paths, two different options as we wander down the full week, Thursday to Thursday paths. Um, And so when we landed on Patriots, Buffalo for that second That's two in a row for the Patriots, back-to-back, Thursday to Thursday, both in primetime. Then they had asked us, if we could, to pair up their West Coast trips. They've got Arizona and Vegas this year. By rotation and standings, every club has the opportunity to reach out to the league office and ask us to pair long trips, and we do all we can. Uh, It's not always easy, and it's not always something we can accommodate, but this year, thankfully, we were able to get uh, everybody who asked, Atlanta, San Francisco, Miami, Las Vegas, Patriots, Dolphins, everybody that asked, we were able to pair up their trips. We were sensitive about where in the season that should fall. The Patriots and the Raiders, uh, because of Coach McDaniels, wanted to practice together in the preseason. So they wanted to play each other and practice together in the preseason. That was going to be preseason week three. So to play the regular season rematch between the Patriots and the Raiders too early in the season – might not have been right, might have limited what they could do with each other in August as they were training and getting ready for the season. So we wanted to keep that Patriots-Raiders game for the second half of the season somewhere. And remember, that Patriots-Raiders game was going to track with it the Patriots-Arizona game. And Patriots-Arizona and Patriots-Raiders both sounded like pretty good football games. So not against the realm of possibility that either or both could have ended up in prime time. This particular schedule put them both in prime, but we looked at schedules where only one was in prime. Um, it was really just kind of random that it fell in. But when we saw it, it wasn't the kind of thing that we look at and say, oh, no, we can't do that. You know, we've got teams that are going to play four straight national television games, whether it's 930 a.m. Sunday or Sunday afternoon, 425 on CBS or Fox. National windows go to the teams that in May we all hope are still in playoff contention by the time we get there. And if not, well, that's what flexible scheduling is for. Maybe that New England Raiders game isn't everything we hoped it would be. If it's not, you can slide it back to Sunday afternoon, find a different game and slide that into Sunday night. Interesting. I know the Patriots have the max of five. I believe there are 13 teams with the max of five. One of the things that kind of came up to me, at least, and I do this every year, I make a tweet of how many teams get primetime games this team gets five this team gets four Detroit having none I know they have a Thanksgiving game but by definition of primetime they have zero is that how does that really happen how come come you do how come you do primetime instead of national tv when you make a chart yeah why primetime why it just feels like those are the standalone games that are at night which I think is the definition of primetime for the NFL definitely the definition of primetime no doubt but Standalone, not necessarily. We've got some 425 Sunday afternoon games. Those do best, right? Yes. By far. By yeah. far. Best yeah. Window. yeah. So there's a lot of those. And as good as those do, they don't come close to what Thanksgiving Day does. Right. Most years, Detroit and Dallas on Thanksgiving, two most watched games of the season. Lately, we've had some big ones. We've been really lucky. We've yeah. got, you know, the big Brady returns to Foxborough and some other kind of jump off the page games. But most years, those two Thanksgiving Day games are in the top three or top five of most viewed games of the season. So 
yeah, if you're Detroit and somebody wants to say, hey, you didn't get on primetime, you got the short straw. Think about the team that got on primetime once, whether it's Monday night or Thursday night on Amazon. They're on one time. They might do one fifth of the viewers that the Lions one national game is going to do. So acknowledge that when we make a list of primetime, Detroit doesn't have any, but we should never lose sight of the fact that they are year after year, no matter what their record, no matter who they're playing, that game is always one of the five most watched games of the season. And that's why I wanted to come back to, because I know it's considered tradition and I know the NFL, essentially it's a business. Has there been ever a thing about maybe just putting the best six teams there instead of, you know, it's always Detroit and Dallas. Will that ever come to a point? Look, never say never. None of us know. It's not up to Charlotte and me. It's, it's up to the owners. Um, but to your point about tradition, you know, like every industry, like every business, like every person, you try to find the balance between, you know, historical, what's worked for you, what you've done forever, uh, and also how to innovate, how to take advantage of new opportunities. We're playing in a lot of windows that we didn't used to play in. Right. Whether it's 930 a.m. on Sunday or Saturday afternoons or side by side Monday nights or double double headers on Sunday afternoons. Um, There's a lot of new windows, but there's still some room for some tradition. You know, there's not a whole lot of things that are still around that anybody, no less any sports league, has been doing since the 30s. So um, certainly not up to us. But um, whenever I believe there's been conversations about, hey, should we move the Thanksgiving day around? Um, you know, it's part of why we added that third game originally on NFL Network and now on NBC. There's an opportunity for the others that want to, you know, get a bite of the hosting on Thanksgiving Apple. They can still get in without us having to undo something that we've been doing in Detroit since the 30s and, and Dallas right. In the 60s. Right. Absolutely. And that's what I was trying to get to, because overall, Thanksgiving is always one of the top three or top four when it comes to viewership and Detroit and Dallas is always there no matter what up until now. Now, going back to Charlotte, I also found this a bit interesting because there are 10 teams playing internationally this year, but only three are getting a buy after. And from my understanding, those teams get to choose if they want to buy after the international game. Are you guys getting a sense that teams are treating the international games as just a regular road game as of recently? Because it used to be no matter what international game, buy. And as of recently, these last couple of years, it feels like some teams are just passing off that. Yeah, you know, Ari, it's a good question. Um, I think that when we originally started going over to Europe, um, particularly it, uh, teams, you know, back then would basically go the whole week before, spend the week there, get their body clocks adjusted, and then want their buy on the week after just to get back to normal and go back to playing football, you know, after a full week of rest. Now we're seeing more of a trend of teams going over later in the week, only staying for a couple days, playing the game, and all four games in Europe this year are at 9.30 a.m. So that means that the teams leave after the football game and are back in their facilities by, you know, call it 2 a.m. or so on Monday morning back in the United States. So they have then that full week to then prepare for that next matchup. You know, you will see that the, the games being played in weeks four and week five None of those teams elected to take their bye. With the expanded season, as you can imagine, that's pretty early to say, I want my bye when I come back from London. I'll take a week five bye. I will volunteer for a week five bye and then have the whole rest of the season to play football without a real break. Yes, you get your mini bye Thursday, but you don't really get that full break. So I think that nobody's really volunteering for that week five bye. So the teams are you know, getting more comfortable with going over and being back in their facilities early enough on Monday morning so that they can still have a full week of prep for the next game. Yeah, but as I said, seven out of the 10 teams opted not to take a buy this year and opted to have it later in the year. Now, Mike, I want to go back to you because I know you guys just finished the schedule. You probably want to take a break, but I keep on hearing that making a schedule next year will be super different. Could you like elaborate on what that means? What's changing next year? And is it true? One of the things that that changes is that NFC going to Fox, CBS getting AFC is going away next year and everything is unattached. It's not going away, but the um, the designation of which network gets it by who the road team is, that part's going away. So Fox is still going to predominantly be the NFC package and CBS is still going to be predominantly the AFC package. But it's not just going to be, you know, CBS is going to need whatever it is, eight Ravens games. It doesn't have to be the AFC team on the road for those eight games. It could be any 
of the Ravens 17 games. So what Charlotte and I are already starting to tinker with is what that does to the, you know, potential number of possible solutions right now. If you've got an AFC team on the road, that game belongs to CBS. If you want to take it away from CBS and put it in prime time or cross flex it to Fox, there's a limit to the number of times you can do those things in any given schedule. Those go away. So now you've taken, you know, this many options of what you can do with AFC teams on the road. Now you've made it into this many options. So every game now has more homes than it might have had otherwise. And we don't have the restrictions that we had in terms of cross flex and primetime takeaways and number of times each team can be taken away from CBS and Fox. Those rules are gone. So every game's a jump ball. Every game's a free agent. Um, it'll make for some interesting discussions uh, in the scheduling room as we try to figure out, oh, that sounds like a game that would normally be on Fox. Well, that doesn't exist anymore. As long as Fox gets their contractually required numbers of Cowboys and Packers games, they don't necessarily have to get Cowboys versus Packers. They don't have to get it now anyway, but there's a limit, again, to the number of times we can take things away. And and it truly is a takeaway. If you're Fox and you know all the NFC yeah. road team games are yours, then when you see one of them on primetime, you're like, hey, you took that from me. Or if you cross flex to CBS, like, ouch, man, you know, knife in the back. Now there's no squatters rights. There's no you know preconceived notion of ownership. Every game's a jump ball. It's going to be a different approach to the entire process. And it's probably, we think, we haven't gotten too far into it, but we think it's actually going to create a lot more options, but slow down the process. Because in order to race from a seed schedule of 40 or 50 games to a finished schedule of 272, you now have so many more different ways to lay out those extra 220, 230, that it's probably going to go a little bit slower. It's going to take a little longer to finish the search. So we're tinkering with bigger seed sizes, different schools scoring systems. We definitely have some work to do to get ready for 2023. We'll, we'll take a break here for a bit to catch our breath, but it won't be long before we'll be back in the room, not just figuring out what the games are like when they're all jump balls, but again, some new windows. We're going to have, like we said, three side-by-side Mondays. So let's see what we learned this year from week two on ESPN and ABC and how we deploy that. I think there's a Peacock game next year. We're going to have to have all our international games selected ahead of time figure out who's going where, have the conversations about where do you want to be the week before? Do you want to buy the week after? Um, Christmas again falls on an NFL game day, Monday. Monday. So uh, I think it's a safe assumption we'll be playing games there again next season, try to figure out who that's going to fall on. Um, so there's a lot to get ready for in 23. We'll, get, we'll give Charlotte a couple of days to rest, <laughs> but we'll be back at it soon enough. And if I'm not mistaken, is flex scheduling also coming to Monday Night Football next year as well? So there are some major changes coming just to everything on your end for next year. And it sounds yeah, like it's not going to be a year long Monday flex. Yeah. It's going to be the last couple of weeks. December. And it's not going to be something. Look, you know this. You've been doing this long enough. We're not cavalier and reckless with Sunday night flex. We only flex <laughs> usually once or twice a year. I think it was um, zero last year, right? And it was yes. zero last year. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't expect, you know, every Monday night game to be uh you know subject to flex necessarily but you know that's something that charlotte and and the team is gonna have to think about when you select a monday night game in week 14 or 15 do you want to be a little risky or do you now know you're introducing the uncertainty of flex maybe you want to save your more you know slam dunk games so to speak for monday night football in december but if you do that maybe you don't have those good brands to deploy early in the season when you want to get the network off to a good start and make sure you catch a team when they're still in playoff contention or before anybody gets injured so there's going to be a lot of philosophical discussions about how to deploy all these assets uh, before we even get into the math and science and search Interesting. So it sounds like there's a lot going on when next year comes. I know there's some time for that, but there was a lot set over there, a lot to digest. I guess let me wrap up with this. When the season starts, when games are being played, and I think you guys both deserve a lot of kudos for last year because the start of the primetime games last year, game after game was down to the last minute. It was a very close game. So you guys deserve a lot of credit for that happening. I believe weeks one to eight was just tremendous with close games. But when the season is going on and games are being played, what are the data points you're keeping an eye on that tells you what the fans want to see? What are you keeping an eye on? How close are you keeping an eye on, I guess, players, jersey sales, and all these different things that tells you fans love this guy, they want to see him? Yeah, you know, I think that we can just go from even just a Sunday afternoon perspective here of how we look at the the maps. So CBS and Fox set the maps and decide which game goes in which market. But we work really closely with them. And we've got a partner called Recentive uh, Analytics who 
takes in all of that information that you were talking about, whether it's, you know, betting data, Jersey sales, fantasy football ownership, any of those sorts of data points that we can, that we can get our hands on. And we have, um, it's essentially AI that, you know, really helps us out with understanding which teams we should put in which markets. And when you look at Sunday afternoon, it's such an interesting mix. We try in the scheduling process to make sure that we have games that cover, cover different regions and that we'll have something interesting for each area of the country over the course of that Sunday. But at the same time, things maybe don't work out the way you want them to. So when there's not a natural game to put in a specific market, what game do you put there? And so a lot of this information can help, you know, lead us to making sure that we're delivering the right games to the fans on a Sunday afternoon. And it's similar in prime time. It's, a, it's the same sort of activity exercise, you know, at, to, at, to your point, Prime's a little bit more set. We kind of, unless we're in flexible scheduling, it, it is what it is. But on Sundays, we have the opportunity to make sure that we're putting the right games in the right market. Absolutely. All right, Mike, Charlotte, I'd like to thank you for coming on the podcast, giving everyone an inside look on all the dynamics involved to put together an NFL schedule. I know it's a difficult task. So thank you for taking the time. I'm sure September 8th will be here in no time. Thank you. Anyway, all right. Thanks let's for <laughs> All the best. Thank you so much, guys. I apologize for going a little bit too much. I did not realize the time was there, but um, thanks again for coming on. I think this will be out probably tomorrow. Great. If your listeners dig this stuff and you want to do this again, kind of mid season, we can do like a little check in. Yeah. Here's what's worked. Here's what hasn't. Here's what we should all be preparing for as we look ahead. Flexible scheduling, Saturday pools. Uh, I don't know if people remember all these conversations, you know, from May when we get to October, but if it's something you're interested in, something your listeners are interested in, uh, either one of us would be happy to come back mid-season and kind of do an update if you want. Well, absolutely. I would love to. I mean, I've been very into this stuff way before it became a whole event with the three-hour shows and everything. I used to read the Peter King columns and everything, so I've always been fascinated by all of it, so um, I think we'll for sure do that mid-season. Yeah, I'll, it's I'll become be a watching. weird little cottage industry, hasn't it? I don't think either yeah. of us ever thought people would yeah. want to talk to us about it, but uh, as you can tell, we can go all day. Uh, we're very lucky, grateful, uh, care a lot, um, and, you know, only want to get better, only want to let the fans know how we got here, and so if uh, if you're interested, let us know. We'll we'll come back. Absolutely. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate that. Thanks, Ari. Right. Take care, All guys. The best.